Okay, I'm Daniel. I'm working with Curity. Uh, at Curity, I work as a solution architect uh, in our API security platform project. Right? So I spend almost all my day with OpenID and OAuth projects. And also doing the OAuth workshops at the Nordic API, Nordic API events. It was a very good workshop this Monday. So if you weren't there, you should come next year. So but today I'm going to talk about a little bit about PSD2, uh, which is a EU directive. Uh, it puts uh, a lot of stress on banks and payment providers to uh, do certain things. It's, uh, it's the second payment service directive that has uh, been activated this January, but they're going to be enforcing it in, by the September 2019. I'm not going to talk about all of the PSD2 because it's a huge spec and I've got 20 minutes. So I'm going to highlight a few key points. So I'm going to highlight that the banks are now forced to give out API access to third party clients. Um, before, where we had these apps that wanted to use your data in a, in a bank, they relied on direct access where the user gave away their password and they did screen scraping and things like that. So we're trying to get away from that. And banks and payment providers are also now forced to do strong user authentication. It always has to be two-factor authentication. And third parties also need to get access to those methods. Third party uh, applications uh, have to use the same types of authentication method as the regular ones do. And these API access the users also always have to give their consent to give away their data. So this is mandated by the spec. So these three things I'm going to highlight. And if you've seen anything else of our presentations, security, we like standards. So we're going to try to solve this uh, architecture by using standards. So first, the use case. We have a user that is a customer at a bank. And now we want to bring in a third-party app of some sort. They want to track your payment history or something like that. So if we were talking OAuth, we would divide this into actors or roles. And these are the actors of this case, I think. We got the user, which in OAuth is called the resource owner. We got the third-party app, which would be the client. We got the APIs or microservices, which is in OAuth the resource server. And then we got and the bank needs to have some kind of OAuth server or OpenID Connect server, the authorization server in OAuth language. So I'm going to base this off the base flow of OAuth, the authorization code grant flow. Uh, this is the, the most recommended way for a client to get tokens. So remember, in this use case, we have the third-party app that needs to get access to the microservices over there. And to do that, we need a token that represents that. So to start the whole flow up, the third-party app needs to open up a browser of some sort. In my case, there's a, it's a phone with a browser. So it's a phone app with a browser component of some sort, but it could just as well be a web app. But we need to point it to the OAuth server. So we point our browser to the OAuth server and identify the client in some kind of way. Uh, just identifying and just specifying what we need access for. The OAuth server can validate the incoming request and see that the client is known. It seems to have the rights to ask for this and proceeds to authenticate the user. So we see a screen and please log in. And as I said, PSD2 mandates uh, two-factor authentication, so we need to add some kind of extra factor in there. Could be a EID, or it can be any other strongly asserted uh, two-factor uh, two method. When we have authenticated, the OAuth server now knows who we are. So now we can proceed in the delegating the access to the third-party app. First of all, we need to ask the user. So is this OK? Uh, we have a third-party app here that uh, requests your data in a microservice. Do you allow that? We've all seen it. We've used Facebook and things like that. So if the user consents to this, this is the user consent part, we can, the OAuth server now can send back a code. 
which is a one-time password or a nonce or whatever you want to call it, to be used to exchange for tokens. So the app client can now close down the browser and in the back channel, first everything happened in the browser, so that's the front channel, and now the back channel, sending that code and exchange it for tokens. And this is the first time the client actually authenticates itself. So now the, the, the OAuth server needs to know that this is the actual app that's asking us for the tokens. And we've passed this authentication, we can give them tokens. Yay. In this case, it's two tokens. It's the ID token and a access token. So the ID token is for the, for the client. Contains information about the user and the authentication, just so that the third-party app can create some sort of session and know who the user is. Maybe they only want a username. The access token, however, is for the, for the API. The access token, in this case, is a random string that does not contain any data. So the client can't read it, can't get any information out of it, but it knows it can use it to get data from an API. So to get that data, first we'd make an API call to get it with the access token. And the API can now do its authorization decision, see that, okay, we have a token, it's supposed to be valid, and based on that, return the data. I said supposedly valid, like a trick, trick question, but uh, so how could the API know that this was valid, right? Something else must be going on. So first I want to mention the different token formats. I said the access token was a reference token or a random string, so we call it by a reference token. This doesn't mean anything to you guys, right? We, there's a random string, we know it's an access token, but doesn't know really what it's all about. And on the contrary, we have the identity token, which is a by-value token that contains data about me. Uh, it says my username is Glindau, and my name or whatever it's needed for the client to be able to make their session. So by reference token is a token for APIs, and it only means anything to the OAuth server. And by-value token can be consumed by whoever needs the information. The value token is signed with a private key of the OAuth server, so the consumer can always validate that this data is correct and it is issued by the OAuth server. So don't trust no one, just trust your OAuth server. Right? Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so when we know that, we know that the, the access token is uh, by reference token, we can do the same API call against the microservice. And the uh, microservice needs to validate the token by asking the OAuth server. So, is this valid? I don't know. And back comes the data that belongs to the token. So, the claims that was tied to this token. Uh, in this case, Daniel did the authentication and the delegation process. And based on that, we can do authorization and send back the data. So this looks good when it's only one API. Imagine 100 APIs, and the third-party app is using all hundreds of them. All 100 needs to validate the same token and ask the OAuth server for the same token. Uh, that's not very optimized, and uh, I don't really like having to ask the OAuth server all the time. So uh, we usually introduce a new player here. Uh, the reverse proxy or API gateway or whatever you have close by. We really need the reverse proxy only. And we let that intercept the API calls. So the client can now send the same API call against the APIs, but it is intercepted by the reverse proxy. And the reverse proxy sends this validation question. Is this token valid? Is it for real? A web server can say, yes, this is real. And instead of returning the claims in a JSON blob, we get you back a uh, JOT, the same by value type token, a JSON document that is signed by the private key and can be trusted that because it's issued by the OAuth server. So that token is now passed on to the APIs. So 
we're now given a by value token to the APIs instead of a by reference. So now the API can uh, look at the signature. Is it correct? Is the token from me? Because the claims will tell you that. And then base its authorization decision off on top of trusted data and give you back the data. So this is something we call the phantom token flow or phantom token. So this is a pattern that we use a lot. Uh, it's in itself not a standard, it's based on standards. So it's very good because it keeps information out of clients that usually don't need it, but we give trusted information to the APIs that should have them. And also enables APIs to be able to make their authorization decisions without asking for validation by a third party. So, next thing, scopes. Uh, to be able to make authorization decisions, you need data to make the decision based on, the base the decision on. So one of those things is scopes. So scopes is status strings that roughly translates into permissions. A right? uh, client can ask for a write scope, uh, so, and that could translate into making a post request to a specific API. Uh, uh, for example, we can define a write transaction scope. And the client always ask, has to ask for the scopes it wants to just this token. And this is also configured in the server, so that each client has only the possibility to ask for a certain type of scopes. So in the first authorization request from the client, you will have to specify which scopes do you want your token for. Um, and skipping ahead a little bit, uh, we are authenticated and now we get that consent screen. The scopes also translates into this consent screen. So test bank A, test app A wants your permission to create a transaction and read your balance. Which is good that we need to consent this, but since it's static strings uh, and you only need to consent each scope once, uh, you get this create a transaction. Uh, don't really want to consent to all future transactions, just want to consent this particular transaction, which static strings doesn't really help with. And it also doesn't really tell me what does this transaction contain. So we want to use something called prefix scopes. You configure in the server saying that this client is allowed to ask for scopes that starts with transaction underscore something. Um, whatever comes next, we allow it to ask for it. And we can treat whatever is after as a transaction ID. So if a client is asking for the right, right transaction underscore foobar, we can show the user a consent screen saying that, that this client is now asking for creating the transaction with the ID foobar, which is at least better because I'm consenting to this actual transaction. But what does it stand for, right? We want to know why am I consenting this. Uh, which brings me into the next OpenID part. Uh, it's part of the core spec of OpenID. It's the request object. Uh, it's a replacement for all the uh, query parameters of OpenID. And if you know OpenID, you know that there can be a lot of different uh, parameters in there. And instead, it allows you to stick it into a JSON document that you sign with a client's private key. So you can build up your JSON document, uh, something like this. Uh, with which would normally be um, query parameters, but instead you set it in a JSON document, you sign it, and you encode it, and you stick that one on the query string. So this is a request object instead. The OAuth server can verify that it comes from the correct client, and it can also uh, do all the same things that we're used to doing in OAuth. The spec also says you can stick an extra data in there, as long as the OAuth server knows it. So that's what I want to use for the transaction part. I want to add into this request object a little bit of a scope metadata. So I made a small object that I called scope metadata, and I put information about the scope in there. So I bake this into Jot, and I send it to 
my OAuth server in the same way. And the consent screen can now look like this. So we're asking for a scope uh, with the transaction ID, tr ID foo. And with the description of that scope, we can say that uh, with this token, I will transfer 100 kroners to Daniel. So, and also read account balance. So when we consent to this screen, uh, a token will be issued that is based off of this consent and this delegation ha has been active and the access token can now only perform this type of um, operation. So we're closing in on the end of only 20 minutes as I said. Uh, I want to summarize. Uh, I'm basing this solution on authorization code grant flow and we're using the phantom token flow which is uh, an implementation of different standards, right? Uh, I think we've seen it in all three of the security presentations, but it's just because it's very good. It keeps information out of clients, and we give, it, give trust and information into uh, the APIs. We can use prefix scopes to uh, attach transaction IDs onto scopes, and we can allow users to grant each unique transaction. And we can use the OpenID request object. Uh, the server can trust the data that comes with it because it's signed by the client. And we can also add some metadata into the scopes, the transaction information, which was what I wanted to solve in the beginning. And we did all this based on standards, security way. So thank you all. Uh, if you want to discuss this more, maybe about registration of PST2 clients uh, that didn't have time with, come by our booth. And also, we have a competition that will draw the winner at three, so hurry up and register. Thank you, guys.